Oh, Father, we thank you. We declare that there will be peace in Nigeria. We declare that there will be peaceful elections. And Father, particularly, I pray for the INEC officials. Father, I declare that they will walk in your wisdom. And they will be divinely protected. I declare that only your will will be done. In Jesus' mighty name we'll pray. Can you give it up for the King of Kings and Lord of as you have your seat? Amen. Please, can you help me welcome everyone watching all over the world? Can we celebrate them? Thank you so much for joining us this beautiful Sunday morning. I know the Bible says that the word of God is quick and powerful. So even where you are, it will be activated in the name of Jesus. I bring you greetings and please help me celebrate my father, your father. Please, can we give him the honor that is due? The angel of our house. Pastor Balaji, we celebrate you. Thank you for the opportunity. And please let me celebrate Pastor Mo. Thank you, Ma. We celebrate you, Ma. May you please have your seats. Hallelujah. Somebody say next level. Continues tomorrow. We call it our final bus stop. Anyone and everyone that you know that has issues, even the ones that don't have issues, they need to be on next level. So please make it a point of duty to remind your friends and family as we, you know, pray in, we'll push until something happens. So this morning, I'm continuing the series that we're doing on consecration. And last week, Pastor Baji taught us about being soldiers, right? I thought somebody would make a soldier sound. Ooh! I've been practicing this sound, but the soft life of me is not allowing me. <laughs> but it was such a powerful message. And this morning, we're going to continue in that stead. You know, life as we know it is a precious, beautiful gift from God. Sometimes, or always, life comes with responsibility. And so, I visited a friend recently, and she had told me, you know, her problems. You know, there's some problems that you hear that you think that your own problem is small. So, I got home, and I really wanted to talk to God. That God, why is there a problem everywhere? You know, and it was, you know, I, I was, I was determined that, you know, I'm actually going to talk to God. That God, if I go here, problem. If I go there, why? Why can I go to a place where there is actually no problem? And then, so I got home and I sat down. I brought my book and paper and pen. And I said, Lord, why is there a problem? Problem, not the finish. And then he answered me very graciously. He said to me, he said, when you send your child to school, do they, do they do test and exam in school? So he says that if they do test and exam in school, life in itself is a school. And so we would continually have tests and exams in this journey of life. So I said, coined it that you mean that life is a, is a school of life. They said yes. And then he said to me that two things are very important in this school of life. He said, firstly, it's the sponsor. So when you send your child to school, you get him, you know, party, I mean, not party, school bag, water bottle. It depends. Even in the university, you pay tuition. You, you get all the textbooks that the child needs. Sometimes you buy extra. He says that in this journey of life, I am your sponsor. And so regardless of what test or exam that you will face, I am the sponsor. And so regardless of the state of life that you and I are in, in the problem or in the trial, there is a father that is running things. That is your father. The Bible says that he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So he says, Bolaji, look at life from a different perspective. Not that there is problem everywhere. He said there will be tests and trials. He said there will be many tribulations. He said, well, be of good cheer because I have overcome. And then secondly, he said to me, he said the second factor in this school of life is you. I said, me, yeah. He said the way that you engage the things that I've given you will determine your outcome in your school. 
So it says that a lot of parents give their children textbooks. You know, they give them different things. But the children get to school and totally forget about the textbooks. And they turn the school into a party place. And then they come out of school. They haven't done well. And then I remembered my brother. I mean, he's doing very well now, so I can share his testimony. He went to do a, an engineering course for five years. So I remember very well. At the fifth year, you know, as a responsible mom now, she would, you know, do everything that she knows she needs to do. So she was counting. It was the fifth year, and it was the last semester. So she had made food, you know, she had music. She was just really happy. And then her son came, and then she was just dancing. Ah, oh, Bolaji, my son has graduated. Was... But the son was smiling sheepishly. So I knew that something was not right. Even though the five years was complete, he had not yet graduated. It was later we found out that he had four extra years. Yes. So he completed nine years by himself. He got to school and he forgot the purpose or the reason why he was in school. And so a lot of us, we get to life, this school of life, and we totally forget that there is a reason and there is a purpose. And then we start to follow anybody, anyhow, anywhere we go, anywhere by left is. You know, and he's my firstborn. And I remember that when he was going into university, I was in GS3. But because he had done what he, you know, he taught best. You know, it was so funny that he even told my mom, he said, follow me to school, go and talk to the lecturers. When, he, when my mother got to the lecturers, the lecturer showed him, he said, he didn't even write anything. She said, if you wrote something, we would, just, we would give him something. He said, he just wrote his name in all his exam papers. I know, but he's doing well now. <laughs> so life, as we know it, is a test. And the question is, what test are you facing? Because all of us, we are facing tests and trials. Some of us is the test of anger or procrastination. Different things. As if they sweet us, if they do us, you know. And so, the way that you engage with your trials and tribulation is what we tell how well you're doing this life. Praise the Lord. So, two, two important reasons why we must do this assignment well. This assignment called life. We must do it well. Number one, promotion. As in the school, when you don't pass exams, what do you do? You repeat. Also, it's the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Luke 16 verse 10, if you can put it up, it says that he that is faithful in little, say much more will be given to him. But we don't want to be faithful in the little, but yet we want promotion. Even at work, you know, we resume work and then we go, uh, we just start playing game, you know, and they tell you to do your call reports, you know, because I'm in the marketing field. They tell me, oh, do your call reports, your marketing plans, you know, your pipeline deals. And, you know, I can just sit down there and be calling people. I'll text you. I'll say, oh, how much? How much are you bringing? You know, and I know that I know that I am not being faithful on that job. And so, because you're not faithful in a little thing, God cannot give you much more thing. Amen. Because God doesn't give his possession to someone that he has not tested. And so I want us to look very quickly at the man called Abraham in Genesis 22. This guy passed his test. Somebody say, pass your test. Genesis 22 verse 1. All right. So it says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Verse 2. He says, and he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac. Hmm. Did you hear the, the only son Isaac, whom thou lovest? Because there's another son. But he said, This one that you love. He says, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee. Verse 3. 
And Abraham rose up early in the morning. You and I cannot boast that if, this, if God gives us this instruction, we'll do it. Yes or yes? Ah. <laughs> but Abraham did it. Scripture says that he, woke, he rose up early the next morning and he saddled his horse and took two of his young men with him. Let's jump to verse 10. It says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. This guy passed the test. I can't begin to imagine what it is, you know, for God to give us or you and I this kind of instruction. But this is where it gets beautiful. Verse 15. He says, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. So the first time he had told him to stop. And verse 16 says, and said, by myself have I sworn. God, though, that says that we should not swear. Because of what Abraham did, because of his level of obedience and faith, God decided to swear to his son. What a promotion. What a promotion. And he said, I mean, the thing that he wanted to, you know, the Bible says that he said the corn of it falls down and dies, he abides alone. So this only son was supposed to have died and that was it. But then God now swore by himself and said that when children you will have in thousands and thousands. And you and I today, we call ourselves Abraham's children. And he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, in multiplying I will multiply thee, thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sun which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. Amen. Amen. So what Abraham really was hoping to have was a promotion. But before the promotion, he had to be tested. And I don't know what God is testing you with because all of us were in different phases of life. But whatever the Lord is testing you with, can you pass it so that you can be promoted? You know, until Hannah went away from her selfishness, she was not promoted. Because I'm sure that Hannah just really wanted to pepper them when her children came. And a lot of us, we were desiring something so that we can show people. But she said to God, God, I'm going to partner with you. Forget about me. I will give you a priest. And immediately she took that stand. You know, her life was changed forever. As life, as we know, is an assignment. And only God can tell us what to do. And it is our responsibility to do that work. Amen. So why do we need to you know, pass this test because it leads to our promotion and our self-development. Hallelujah. Second reason why we have to do well in life is that he empowers us for bigger opportunities. When David got to the place of his opportunity, he was not worried. He was okay with Goliath. Why? Because he had passed his test in the wilderness. He told the king, he said, king, worry not. A, sheep, a, a bear came, I killed the bear. He said, a lion came, I killed the bear. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He said, I will slaughter him. And that's why you, we cannot despise the days of little beginning. The Bible says that this is the confidence that we must have. So we pass the test so that we can have confidence. I don't know how many of you, you know, you had small deals and then you felt very proud of yourself that I can do more. This is why we don't despise the test and the trials. Because what the bigger opportunity is in the future. And we know that life really is not measured by how long you live, but how much you contribute to life. And so for you to contribute to greater things, you have to take big opportunities. Amen. And so David, the guy at the backside, nobody knew him, but he was faithful. And so when it was time for him to, to be presented to the world, he did his deed. Amen. Somebody say he did his deed. Hallelujah. The challenge that we go through is a proof of the power of God. They asked Jesus, they said that, who sinned? He said, nobody sinned. It's so that the God can manifest his power. So you face that trials and tribulation. This thing, you will would, you would bow to the name of God. 
In the name of Jesus. And so, life as we know it is an assignment. And guess who sent us to this life? God. Who sent us to this life? And we know that he has paid the price, right? He's bought us, you know, we are his prized possession. I need you to look at that scripture. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. Are we getting blessed? Scripture says, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. It says that they are God's. So you and I, we nobody, you know, in the after in the before life, none of us here said to God that God, I want to come to life. Because even if he did, we will not choose Nigeria. But we are here. That means that there is someone that has sent us here. Amen. Now, he didn't just send us here alone. He also paid the price for us. The Bible says that we are his prized possession. His asset is belonging. And so, because we belong to him, what do we do? We represent him everywhere that we go. Somebody say amen. We go about his business. Somebody say, I go about God's business. You know, in the Bible, we were mostly called disciples. Who are disciples? Disciples are people that place priority on the work of their master. Disciples are men and women that understand that their life is not their own. And so whenever and however the, the master wants it, they are ready to give it up. A disciple is someone that understands that the purpose of, his, of the master is their desire. They understand that their existence is to do the mandate of the father. You and I, we understand. We have come to that understanding that we came here because of God for his mandates and for his instruction. Amen. And so two things that a disciple does, a disciple represents God. You represent your master anywhere that you are. You represent his interest totally. And then a disciple fulfills the, the, the mandate of his master. And then I see in the book of Acts 21, you know, there's a, there's a prophet called Agabus. Agabus had taken the belt of Paul. And then he tied it to himself and he had a word. And he said that whoever has this belt, he said, this is what will happen to the person. If the person goes to Jerusalem, the person will die. And then they started crying and begging Paul, don't go, don't go. And then Paul showed up and said, why are you crying? He says that if I die, he's gain. But definitely the gospel of God must go to Jerusalem. And so he was passionate about the master's cause because God had sent him to the Gentiles. And you and I, the Gentiles, we have the message of God now because someone like Paul took the message to us. Amen. And then we had, um, I think, Acts 2. Peter and John, or Paul and John, they were teaching in the, in, the, in, the, in the synagogue. And then some people came to tell them that you can't teach again. You can't teach the word of God. They looked at them and said, Am I to obey you or to obey the one that sent me? Sometimes we want to post something on social media. We want to do certain things, but we are concerned. What will my neighbor say? What will this person say? When they are doing their own, they are not concerned about us. But we, the disciples of God, we need to focus on God and him alone. And so what is his mandate to us? Two mandates. That we will bring greater glory to his name. In whatever, rest, in whatever sphere of life that you are in, your mandate is that you bring greater glory to his name. Your mandate is for you to expand the kingdom of God. And this is a mandate that you and I have. It's not specialized to the pastors. It says that we are the city set upon a hill. And so we see in the book of Romans 1 verse 1. Let's look at that very quickly. How Paul introduced himself. I love Paul. Father, we thank you, Lord. He says, I, Paul, a servant of Jesus, is a call to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. NIV says it this way. He said, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. He says, called. He was sure of his identity. He was sure of his purpose. He said, I'm called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. 
He was saying that I am willingly self-committing to an everlasting life of service to God. He was sure who his identity is. It's not today we are Christians, tomorrow we are somebody else. Paul was sure that in this life, this life that is an assignment, this is who I am, a disciple of Jesus. I will follow him to the end of the world. And so as disciples, we must represent God wherever we go to. And even as we represent God, we need to begin to pay attention to our environment. I see like never before that the, that the devil is cooking a lot of things. You know, and I was telling them the other day that I hear of what, something called yoni massage now. You know, and they're institutionalizing prostitution in our very before. Meanwhile, the Bible says that the marriage bed should be undefiled. You know, and we see how people like you and I are sponsoring, sponsoring homosexuality and pornography. And we see how people, all of a sudden, there's anxiety, there's suicidal, there's attack on marriages, and the devil is pushing us his agenda. And you and I, as priests, as disciples of God, we must stand and we will no longer stay in the shadows. In the name of Jesus. We will no longer be an echo. You know echo? Echo, what they are saying is not clear. We are unsure. You know, I don't want to talk too much before they call me an hypocrite. No, you will talk. Every room that you feel, your voice must be heard. Because we will no longer be an echo. In the name of Jesus. Why? Because the Lord is raising us in this time as disciples, as soldiers for himself. So you and I were no longer echoes. When they know us, when they see us, they know what we represent because we will speak. Our social media will go on fire for Jesus. Every time that we come to the house of God, we are telling people, everyone that gets this, there is salvation here. We are no longer an echo. We will no longer stand in the shadow. The Bible says, let your light shine before men so that they can see the good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. No more pretense in the kingdom of God. No more hypocrisy. We come out of the shadow and we stay in the light. Why? Because it is God that works in us what to will and to do. To stay in the light is of God, not of you. He says that we are indeed the light. We are indeed the influencers of the world. We will no longer stand on the fence. Jesus did not die so that we can settle. He died so that we can dominate. Christians, no more. Say no more. We rise as disciples in one language, in one accord. Depopulating hell. Expanding the kingdom of God. Bringing greater glory to the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And so we will no longer settle. Tap your neighbor, say, we will no longer settle. This kingdom, God's will will be done through our lives in the name of Jesus. And this is why we can't stay idle anymore. We can't. We can't stay idle anymore. Your time has to count. The Bible teaches us about redeeming your time. This is how you invest your life, not use your life. So that your time can count in the afterlife. Because all of us are building our lives. Our lives, our assignment. Our lives, our responsibility. They cannot exchange somebody else's life for your life. So we maximize our time for the kingdom of God. We maximize our resources. Those people that are sponsoring Boko Haram and sponsoring pornography, we are coming. We are coming. That's why when you make your projection plan, you don't make it for you and your family. That purpose is too small. You project so that you can depopulate Syria, set up an island for them, and tell them for you to live in this island, you must become Christians. Wouldn't they become Christians? Bring it, bring it. There is more to us than it is. It can't just be you and your family. God cannot have created you for that. We would give of our time. We would give of our energy. The Bible says that the glory of the youth is in his strength. This is the day of our strength. These are the days that we must use, not when we are tired and out. We will not be carrying Bible and say we are going to something, something. 
this time, now, in this youth, this strength must be for God. And it will be in the name of Jesus. And you know, we, are, we, are, we have an evangelism, evangelism team. Every Saturday, they, they start from here to evangelize. You can join them. We have a children's church. You can join them to build godly children. We have a benevolence team. You can give to the poor. There is so much to do in the house of God. There is an NLP team. You can be a tele evangelist, evangelist for Christ. You can say that I want to take NLP to another country. There's so much to do. So much to do. So much to do for God. In Bayande. No more sitting on the fence. Tap your neighbor, say no more sitting on the fence. I am a disciple. And I will be a disciple. In the name of Jesus. So as a disciple, what next? Join the workforce. Be on the discipleship journey. Can we turn our Bibles to Romans 12 verse 1? The message translation. Pastor, so I just read this in the first service and really it popped. When I say it popped, I mean it popped in my heart. It's not like it popped like popcorn. <laughs> All right. Romans 12 verse 1. Message translation. So the Bible says, so here's what I want you to do. This is a discipleship process. He said, God helping you. He said, take your every day. He said, take your ordinary life. He says, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to walk, and you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. He says, bless your life. AKJV says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. You know living sacrifice? Something that is living and dead at the same time. Because you are living to a God, but you are dead to the world. He says that bless everyday life, everything, every day, your thoughts, your yearning, your wills, everything, bless it at the master's feet. That is a life of discipleship. And discipleship... Uh, what God will have us do, he didn't say raise Christians. He says raise disciples. Your test of Christianity is that you are a disciple. You know, so even as we talk about this discipleship, I need you to go back home to really, you know, sit with yourself. I want to be a disciple for God. I want that when they are counting them, when they are giving them the part of the ministry, I, disciple, Bolaji, is part of them. He says, and then another way to stay as a disciple, have other discipleship friends. Amen. Because if you are the only one, the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. Amamo. So have other people, you know, so, some friends need to be changed, honestly. Thank you, my sister. <laughs> you know, one time I had this friend. I don't even know where I got that from, honestly. Well, <laughs> everything was wrong. I was going to make a decision. Everything was wrong. Guess what she told me? She said, Baji, from my experiences, everything is negative. That means that that's what you should do. Uh, and guess what? I did it. Ah, I suffered. <laughs> Some friends need to be changed. Lastly, make a decision to show off God. It takes intentionality to show off God. You know how women, you know when they buy new hair, you know how they show it off? You don't know. Uh, check their Instagram page. <laughs> That's how you know that they are showing off something. The way that you buy new hair and you show off God, that's the same way that you will have different things in your calendar to show off God. Different things. If God did something to you, you show it off. Tomorrow you say, Lord, I want to speak to marriages. You, you put something there. Be intentional about showing off God. Don't let the world dictate to us how we want to show off our God. Any which way we want to show him off. Amen. And as I close this morning, there's one thing that, you know, how you, you listen to a message like this and you feel like, okay, okay. And then by the time you get home or by the time Monday and Tuesday happens, you have forgotten the message. But one thing that you must realize is that the word of God is the word of God. 
when the Bible says that for them that believe, he has given them the power to become the sons of God. Believe it literally. That the power and whatever you need to stay as a disciple, God has given to you. The Bible says in John 2 verse 20, you can, you can open it. It says that you have an unction from the Holy One. You, not me, you have an unction, not just the pastors. You have an unction from the Holy One. And you can do all things and know all things. You come loaded already. So all you have to do, my brothers and sisters, show up and speak and God will fill your mouth. The Bible talks about Peter. He said, Peter just told them oh, that the Jesus that you crucified has not resurrected. The Bible says 3,000 people were filled with the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is show up and speak. Don't let the devil tell you otherwise. Why? Because you have an unction from the Holy One. God by himself is the one sponsoring you. For himself. For the expansion of the kingdom of God. So as disciples, we do no longer sit on the fence. In the name of Jesus. This morning, you know, we talk about discipleship process. But there are certain people in our midst that perhaps you're still really thinking, Lord, am I even your, am I even your child? You know, and this morning we want to give you an opportunity to, to just confess your love to God. All heads bow. If you're making that decision today, that Jesus, I want you to be everything, my priority, everything. Online, there is a form to fill. Can you raise up your hands and, as I pray with you? The Bible says that for those of them that he has called, he has glorified. And so if the Lord is talking at your heart this morning, can you open your heart to him? Oh, Father, we thank you. Can you say with me, Lord Jesus, thank you for calling me. Thank you for all that you have done. I acknowledge that you died and was raised up from my dead. And I declare, I relinquish all powers and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life today, now and forever. In Jesus' mighty name. And Father, I pray for your children making that decision this morning. Thank you for the new journey. Lord, I'm asking for a fresh encounter with your word. I'm asking for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking that daily you reveal yourself to them. In the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise and glory, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we'll pray. Amen. We're going to pray. Tap your neighbor say, we're going to pray. Can we rise to our feet to pray this morning?